Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mina Salami, and I am a, an associate with Perspectiva and a feminist theorist with Perspectiva as well. Um, and I'm here today with my colleagues, uh, Dan Nixon, Anna Katharina Schaffner, and Jonathan Rousen. Um, to talk about Dan Nixon's essay, which we published very recently, um, and it's part of our Perspectiva essay series. And the title of the essay is, What is This? Uh, the Case for Continually Questioning Our Online Experience. It's an essay that um, I've worked very closely with Dan on um, as the editor of the essay. Um, so I just wanted to start by just sharing some very brief reflections of mine before we, we kind of start with the, the discussion. Um, so as the title implies, uh, this is a, an essay about how we interact online um, today in our societies. Um, but it isn't simply about how we interact in terms of uh, what we post or what we like, um, or what kinds of comments we make on people's posts or what we retweet, et cetera. It, it's far more in depth than that. It's looking at um, how, we, how we interact online with, with our bodies um, and, with, and how that in return um, shapes our, our experience of the digital platforms that we engage with. Um, and the essay looks at very many things. I mean, Dan talks about uh, it kind of Zen practice and how that informs um, or how that could inform our, our online interaction, um, both from the perspective of, of Zen practitioners, um, others than Dan himself, which, which he also is. Um, Dan looks at phen phenomenology, um, that theory that I can never pronounce, um, as well as um, one of the things that is really powerful about the essay is the, the interiority that you bring to it. Um, and so it's, a, it's kind of a, a poetic and an, and an artful essay um, while simultaneously grounding us in, in really uh, big concerns of our times. Um, there are two words that the essay really left me with as a reader, um, and they're not necessarily words that you engage with at depth per se, but the words are um, attentiveness and distraction. And we talk a lot about distraction. Um, you know, I think that that's something that particularly in the past year or two has been, um, there's been books published about how social media um, distracts us and how it creates addiction and things like that. But attentiveness um, is something that I feel we, we focus on uh, uh, less than we should perhaps. Mm -hmm. And so while your essay is not really, um, or it's not by any means seeking to provide the solution um, to these problems, because there probably isn't a solution, right? It's, a, it's an ongoing uh, query. Um, but I do think that by bringing these words to mind, bringing attentiveness and distraction, like what, what does it really mean to be attentive and what does it mean to be distracted? Um, your essay does kind of contribute toward some kind of, not a solution, but at least a, a, a place of presence, a place of query. Um, and it does so with this really simple question, um, three words, what is this? Um, so thank you for, for the contribution. Um, you know, it's a really exciting essay and I hope that everybody watching this will, will um, make sure to read it. Um, but speaking of people who haven't read it, um, I wondered if you could just share with us uh, a brief overview um, from your perspective, what is the essay about? And for people who have read it and also those who haven't, um, maybe you can also share what motivated you. Um, to, to write the essay. Sure. Thank you so much, Mina. Uh, and um, yeah, the essay, uh, as you kind of alluded to, uh, really centers around these three very short words, what is this? And uh, really what I was uh, hoping, uh, what I'm doing in the essay is, it feels to me that there's a set of issues that we face individually, uh, collectively, um, with and through our digital technologies, uh, a set of problems, if you like, and, um, at the social level, I think we're all familiar with, um, with polarization, with tribalism, with uh, what it means to, to see one another, to be with one another, with and through our technologies. And there's, there's the good and the bad there. Uh, and, and more kind of individually, I guess, as you said, uh, distractedness, scattered attention, uh, also passivity, uh, you know, not really being engaged uh, with much of what we're kind of uh, consuming online uh, can, be, can be a problem as well. And so 
the list goes on as to you know, challenges we all face uh, with and through tech. And it's not just our online uh, experiences, but how the whole, I call it the digitally mediated life world that we're you know, inevi inevitably a part of at the moment shapes um, everything that we do online and offline. And with all of that, I guess, um, if there's one really helpful way of making sense of all of this that I kind of landed upon from um, uh, thinking about this, and I've done work on, uh, on attention in the digital space for Perspectiva in the past and, and for other NGOs as well. And I guess coming back to what it means to see, to see fully, to see richly, to see each other, to see ourselves, to see through and with our technologies. For me, it felt like this lens of seeing uh, was extremely helpful because before we get into the specifics and we need to get into them, but before we jump into the problem of a highly polarized political climate or the problem of fake news, the problem of whether or not um, social media platforms can self-regulate and if not, who needs to do what? And all of those questions need space and need discussion. But before we go into those, I think resting with this idea of what is it that I am seeing and I, how am I able, in which ways am I seeing myself and others through tech, felt to me like a very helpful lens. And I opened the piece with, um, with a few quotes from, uh, from the American uh, photographer through the, from the depression era and, and the decades that followed Dorothea Lang. And Lang um, once remarked, and it really caught me um, uh, this comment that uh, she was talking about cameras, that was her instrument. And she said that the camera is an instrument uh, which can teach people how to see without a camera. And, you know, tiny bit counterintuitive, but it does, it does make sense uh, when you think about that. And it really got me thinking, you know, can we aspire and actually demand that our digital technologies, whatever form they take, uh, can be technologies which help us to see both with, but also without them. In other words, of course, we can see so much more with and through social media, our smartphones, we see what's going on in the world and we need to, but can we see with them and also without them uh, better, more richly, more fully uh, and, in, and in a shared capacity. So with all of that as, as context, um, I explore in the essay actually a very, very simple methodology, which is, as you said, bringing this very simple uh, meditation practice, but it's a, an applied meditation practice that I present here, just coming back again and again and again to the question, what is this? What is this? Uh, when we meet our, um, our experience online, through tech, through Zoom, through whatever it is that you're engaging with. Um, and when I say uh, kind of asking, what is this? It's an attempt to continually cultivate uh, an open-ended spirit of questioning. And by that, I mean, not so much a cerebral or intellectual effort to pin things down and ask us, oh, so what's going on here and, and, and how can I understand them better? That may follow, but it's actually before that, resting with the question itself in an embodied sense, just asking uh, with your whole body, whole mind at the present moment, uh, what is this that I'm meeting here in my experience, um, whether that's online or offline? Um, so maybe we'll talk a bit more about that, but that's kind of based on a Zen practice, uh, but very much I'm bringing that into all that we meet online. And uh, just to sketch out, you know, very roughly, I look at three uh, levels to our experience, because I think this is quite helpful, because of course, where do you start with questioning your, your experience? And the first level is at the very simple um, uh, the very simple layer of our immediate experience, when you find yourself picking up your phone when you didn't plan to, or Google, Googling some, uh, something that something just popped in your head and you want to know the answer for. And just dropping in that question, whatever it is we're doing with tech, oh, what is this that I'm doing? Or what's this that I, that's here before me? Just asking again and again. And it sounds like a funny thing to do, but actually the more you do it, the more it can actually open up, uh, I think a lot of space for us to then choose how we want to use tech and what's going on uh, with and through tech. So there's our very obvious, everyday experience. The second layer, um, as you might expect, goes to um, the factors, uh, the forces behind the scenes, which are really driving and shaping what it is that we meet uh, uh, in our you know, digitally mediated experience. So all of the analyses many of us will be familiar with around um, how algorithms you know, really shape what it is that we're presented with, 
echo chambers, individualized uh, news feeds, um, and, and you know, lots of uh, critiques, excellent critiques that I cite in the paper in this space. Where I look at on that front in terms of what's kind of going on behind the scenes that really shapes our experience, um, as Marshall McLuhan calls, in what ways is the medium itself the message? Um, and, and where I look at on, on that front is really issues of embodiment and also issues of ego. How do those come in to really quite fundamentally shape actually what's going on and what we encounter online and why is that important? And then the third and final kind of layer or level of experience, if you like, harder to pinpoint is, is, is broadly um, what artists sometimes call uh, the concept of negative space or what, what are we not presented with uh, that's actually quite important or very deeply important uh, that speaks to our humanity, again, with and through text. So for instance, um, you know, what does silence even mean or, or, or sound like um, a deeper sense of silence through technology or spaciousness? And I talk about intermundane space, the space that connects us between uh, and within us uh, ourselves socially as living breathing, beating bodies together. Um, so I explore their mysteriousness of our experience, spaciousness, stillness, silence, all those things which actually um, we all uh, get, but it's very, by their nature, very hard to kind of isolate or pinpoint and, and, and therefore I think very hard to, um, to have a meaningful discussion about uh, in, a, in a tech context. So um, I'll leave it there. I'll just say the last thing is, it may sound there that I'm kind of going through layers of complexity where the kind of end point is to get to this very important discussion about the mystery of experience and silence and all of those things. And in a way that's true, but of equal importance. Um, and, and, and certainly people will get that level two, are the actual factors that are shaping what we perceive. Uh, that's of course important too. But I'd perhaps like to emphasize that it is equally that very, very basic layer the simple stuff of just noticing how your body feels when you're checking Twitter, or just noticing what's going on when uh, you're just grabbing your phone at, at, you know, at the bus stop rather than doing something else. It's that very basic layer of just questioning what's going on here um, that I think is uh, of equal value and something maybe um, very much which captures hopefully uh, the, the heart or the spirit of, of Zen and, and some of the phenomenological, uh, if I've said it correctly there, uh, thinkers um, that, I, uh, that I cite in the Peace. Uh, so you muted me though. Thank you. Um, yes, that certainly felt for me. I mean, because I think one of the things to say with this essay is that, or to encourage people to do is to actually try it out. Um, when I first read it in, in the beginning of the editing process, I didn't do that because I was so accustomed to just intellectualizing an essay that you read. Um, but then by the second round or so, I found myself you know, going onto Instagram or Twitter or wherever and just saying, what is this? Um, and it was quite an interesting uh, thing to do. So I, I certainly think that that level is one not to be missed. Mm. Um, Anna, you mentioned in, in an email thread that you were uh, quite interested in the kind of the, the ego and how that connects with the embodiment question in, in Dan's essay. Maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, um, thank you, Mina. And uh, thank you, Dan, for a fantastic piece of writing. I really, really enjoyed your essay and I actually have lots of questions. So I have to limit myself a little bit. It's such a rich piece of um, writing that evokes very profound questions. So I think one of the points that it really brought home to me is, you know, ambivalence. It's, you know, the new technologies are both good and bad. You know, they enable collaborations and connections. And at the same time, they do horrible things to our psyches, to our attention and to our bodies. Um, but it's a bit like food. So we can't just cut them out of our lives completely. We actually need to learn to live with them. And um, one of the points that stuck with me is that you call for this post-solution paradigm. Um, post-solutionist paradigm for our relationship with technology. Um, and I love the line, um, I think you quote Peter Sims, who says, um, questions are the new answers, which is a wonderful quotation. And another quotation I really loved is, um, you quote, you cannot, 
And he writes, what you're taking for granted is always more important than whatever you have your mind fixed on. And you were talking a little bit just there about, um, you know, constantly asking, what is this? What is this? And that um, pertains to our behavior with technology, our uh, engagement with technology, but at the same time also, you know, the deeper um, structural and economic issues that shape the technologies that, that we are using. Um, and I was reminded of um, meeting a journalist who, who had a really great theory about the Daily Mail. He basically argued that it's a bit like coffee to its readers, because it's designed to make people as angry as possible. So angry about, you know, benefits scrounging foreigners and horrible EU bureaucrats, of course, but more interestingly, about um, lots of content on opinions presented in the paper itself. So they deliberately produce a triggering response. You know, they deliberately publish a lot of stuff that they know will anger and enrage their readers. And it seems to me that the internet is very much structured like that. You know, the more outraging statements get more clicks, more tension and so on. Um, so basically, we, we have this digital culture that very much runs on adrenaline and cortisol. Um, and in, in some ways, uh, I think we need a digital culture that runs on oxytocin, but that doesn't sell. And I think you make that point beautifully in your essay, because it would run counter to many business models of most of the platforms that we're using. Um, and one of the points in your essay that really stuck with me is that you write that digital media deliberately engineer a culture of conflict, rather than expressing positions of the so called culture war, which seemed to me a very um, smart and important distinction to make. So I just wanted to ask you, um, do you see any way in which we could collectively shift to more oxytocin driven interactions online? Or is there really a fundamental clash with the business models and operation on most platforms that would just make this unachievable? Do you know of any, any platforms or formats that, that would encourage that? Sure. Yeah, thank you so much for those reflections. And um, I just say quickly, first of all, on, you mentioned kind of one of the key kind of calls that I make in the piece is we have a problem with this solutionist paradigm that, you know, tech tends to presume what the uh, questions are, what the problems are uh, before actually opening, open, openly um, investigating them. Um, and and you, when what's interesting is you quoted there from the Peter Sims article, the questions are the new answers. Um, and that's and the irony is that that comment was made um, in relation to uh, the likes of Jeff Bezos and, um, uh, and Sergey Brin and, and Larry Page and others who, um, you know, of course, founders of big tech uh, companies who themselves had them premised on doing things differently and, and, and really questioning things very openly. And, 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 of, and, and of course, there are many ways in which those, you know, I don't want to uh, paint too um, uh, kind of binary a picture here. There's many ways in which we can use the big tech um, apps as well uh, in questioning ways, in, 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 in post-solutions ways, but often what we're given is uh, very much conforming to this kind of solutionist paradigm. And so to, to, to ask for a post-solutions paradigm is um, one which on the one hand always, of course, helps us to um, get things done, to, to perform tasks, to find out information, to connect with each other, all the things that we value. Um, but always, if you like, within a container, of supporting on the side of the of the user uh, of the interactor um, a, a healthy open spirit of questioning a healthy um, questioning as to okay but maybe I could do this differently as well and I don't need to just take this answer um, and so for example uh, you know some of the um, slogans uh, that have been used in advertising and marketing for uh, for big tech and this maybe is no surprise um, to hear but you know uh, Google had ran with an, an ad campaign a couple of years ago which was um, make Google do it you know. Don't worry about it, just make Google do it. And um, with Twitter, um, you know, Twitter claims to be what's going on in the world. And you could argue very much that it's a reflection of what's going on in the world, but in, in a very particular way. And one of the things I suggest in the article is just to work with questioning how much is what I engage with on Twitter, what's going on in the world versus how much is it more a case of 
more what opinions are going around right now. And of course, uh, there's an interesting study from uh, Pew Research Center in, in the US um, a couple of years ago, uh, but still kind of found that in the US context, it's basically around 2% of the US population uh, account for 80% uh, of, 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 of tweets uh, that are kind of originating in the States. So just to really uh, push that point, basically, is this what's going on or is this what opinions are doing the rounds? And even whose opinions, of course, are the ones that get the most traction. And, and, and as you alluded to, why does certain, why does certain content um, get more traction than others? And it is typically the more provocative, the more clickbait, the more cortisol inducing content, as we know, um, uh, that, tends to, um, that tends to kind of get the gravity uh, center. Um, and one thing I explore, I mean, maybe this point around we get triggered easily, the things which um, go viral tend to be things which are maybe um, outrage inducing, etc. This is a point I think most people readily get. But another source of uh, what I describe um, egoic kind of fueling or kind of uh, fueling of the egoic charge of what we meet online is, is a little bit subtler. And I think it's the generality uh, of what we're solicited to engage with. Um, I mean, first of all, in the case of our smartphones, they do everything in once. Multifunctionality is very efficient in many ways, but also it means, of course, you go to your phone to, use, to do one thing and you get sucked down into something, uh, uh, something different. But in the case of um, many platforms, you know, when I go to Twitter, I'm increasingly feel that I'm just checking in with what's there. So rather than a, you know, an interest I've got in particular sport, particular music, it may have started out that I followed particular musicians, particular sports uh, players, but very quickly, I find myself checking in with Twitter. And what is Twitter? It is, again, I think, um, a load of opinions. Um, and I, I quote the, you know, a quote from the Buddha in the piece um, from the Sutta Nibbata that people with opinions just go around bothering one another. Mm. And I find that helpful to rest with and just to really stress the point here, and we can discuss this, but the point is not that opinions are bad. We should not form opinions and we should just all be very mindful, but rather it's that how we engage with our own opinions and others is very much shaped by uh, the architecture of, of, of the platforms that we're using. Uh, and so just to question ourselves, okay, do I want to go into this, what I call world of opinions on Twitter, say on Reddit or whatever, um, or what options do I have to maybe engage with other things online? Uh, you know, I, I give the example of um, artistic expression. Um, it's not propositional. Of course, people can have a reaction to it and they may hate it or they may troll the artist, but you know, people are expressing things in all sorts of ways, but often, the center of gravity in platforms like Twitter's case can often come back to this um, kind of world of opinions or world of ego. Um, and, and I think just raising awareness of that as an issue of questioning that ourselves with each other as we're doing now, I, I see as kind of the first step towards thinking, okay, what could that more post-solutionist paradigm look like and, and, and have a conversation about it. Yeah, but be, being aware of what a friend of mine calls the banality of ego in that space yeah. as well. Some great expressions. I love that banality of ego and also the oxytocin thing. But maybe I can I can ask I have a question around that. But before I do, I'm sure you have lots to say, Jonathan, on um, opinion making on Twitter or on social media at large. So I have no opinions on the matter and I have no solutions to offer, um, but I do bring up my body and um, my breath and all of that. So, um, no, I, I really love the essay and encourage everyone, of course, watching this to read it. In all candor, can I apologize to viewers for any choppiness in the internet connection? That's coming from me. I did offer a ritual sacrifice to the Wi-Fi gods before we came on air, but it seems they didn't receive it. So um, I hope that this is coming through clear enough. But looking at people's faces, it may not be. I don't know. Um, so Dan, the reason I, one of the main reasons I liked it is that it is the kind of, as Mina alluded to, the kind of Zen heart of it. Um, and I actually, the first book of Stephen Batchelor's that I read was A Faith to Doubt, uh, one of his earlier books. 
And in there, they were talk about great, you know, little doubt, little awakening, great doubt, great awakening. Um, and you also quote his wife, Martine. Um, and this notion that we somehow question without seeking, quite the purpose of the question not being the answer as such, but the embodied visceral experience of being in a questioning relationship to reality, being somehow the fundamental offering in the essay. Um, because look, there's an abundant tech critique out there, right? I mean, for, for about two decades now, we've had people critiquing the, the sort of model that we're walking into, the sort of data-driven experience extracting surveillance capitalist kind of model and all of that means for addiction and polarization um, and the breakdown of civil society and the public, the private control of the public sphere and all of that. And that's all there. And as you acknowledge, that's not really what the essay is about. The essay is, is about saying, look, yes to all of that in the sense that we have to contend with it. But one of the ways we begin to contend with it is by regaining sovereignty over our own experience. And one of the methods to do that, so you're going beyond critique and even beyond kind of vision to something more like method and saying one of the methods is just ask yourself, what is this, right? So, I mean, this is true even of this call, of course, and it's true of any given moment of human experience that we can always ask, what is this? But I think the, the beauty of the essay for me is primarily coming back to that experience of being, I think, was it Camus, Albert Camus famously said um, something about the, the, the questioning human and the answerless universe. But it's not, you don't have to believe it's an answerless universe to value asking the question. It's just that there's something about the friction created by that moment of querying what's going on that, that, gets, that circumvents our reactivity, circumvents our habit formation, uh, and habit energy, and is therefore really a precious source of fuel for any strategy for renewal that may be of a more programmatic policy kind of nature. Um, so that's just in terms of a yeah. appraisal, that's why I like the essay. What's distinctive about it? What makes it different from Tom's uh, that we released more recently, Tom Chatfield's, is that you're actually insisting on the, the sort of the, the active ingredient of our own reflexive awareness of our experience and saying, look, if I read you correctly, I think you're saying all of this stuff about the automatic system being overwhelmingly powerful um, and human beings having no real free will and actually being craven creatures subject to our own impulses and habits that are easily manipulated and coerced by powers way beyond our control. You're saying, yes, but nonetheless, there, we do have some freedom. We have to cultivate it, train it, uh, and it requires skill and dedication, but it starts by questioning, what is this? And you give some great examples in yeah. the essay about ridiculous things that happen and why at those moments, what is this scrolling at 1 a.m. for who knows what? What is this ridiculous <laughs> image that I'm completely transfixed by? The question of what, what follows from that is challenging. Um, but what I really wanted to get to know more from you about um, is, a, is this relationship between the opinion and the ego, because this is called the digital ego project. And the notion that we, when we enter Twitter, we enter a world of opinions and that that's the defining feature of it. And that what enters are these embodied egos who sort of lose their body in the process of entry, like almost like it's a, an entry price or something to the digital sphere. Surrender your body at the door bring your ego and off we go. I kind of want to know more from you about how you see that relationship between ego and opinion. Um, because it seems to me that if we understand the ego better, whether through contemplative practice or some other means, it might help us survive better and even thrive in the world of opinions. Sure. Yeah. And perhaps just very, just first of all, you mentioned the, um, you mentioned there, uh, the tension, uh, kind of quite generative tension um, from asking the question itself in, in the face of what it is we're presented with the questioning per se, uh, offering that tension and, and then what follows from that. And I just kind of say on that point that it, as well as attention, you can also think of a lightness. And I, I think the lightness hopefully comes through with the simplicity, you could say kind of the silliness of 
over and over again asking what is this? I mean, Stephen Batchelor um, writing about this talks about, um, and I thankfully we don't have to do it this way, but he talks about sitting for hours uh, in, in a meditation hall, um, hours each day in silence, just resting with what is this, with the question, what is this? It's kind of a crazy thing to do. And, and, and in our digital context, you know, I think Mina, we, you know, through reading the essay together and, and talking about it, um, this kind of, uh, when you talk to other people about the practice of asking, what is this, without expecting any answers, it is a kind of slightly odd, uh, quite, kind of quirky, but quite fun thing to do. And there's a lightness there. And actually that lightness, uh, you know, as humor is, is, is very helpful, I think, in an egoically charged uh, environment or um, in a, you know, kind of a clash, uh, culture clash environment, I think. And the other thing on, on lightness and, and on being kind of, um, things feeling quite silly is uh, talk about embodiment in the essay and Jonathan this speaks to your point about um, uh, ego um, and 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 kind of where we go from that because one of the things I, I kind of uh, explore is asking you know in the context of Twitter for example what is it like to you know are, are, we're presented with people streams of information quite um, quite you know uh, bite size it's very easy uh, to interpret what we meet with someone's opinion, someone's views, and this is what they stand for, and either it resonates in a positive way or a negative way. Um, and so what is it to just actually take a step back and think, what if I considered these millions of people and a few bots maybe as well, but these millions of people here as a kind of global constellation of fragile, uh, breathing, uh, pulsing, embodied beings, human beings in embo through embodiment. Um, because this embodiment, like you said, that we typically leave at the door because when we are um, very much absorbed, absorbed in, these, um, in these spaces, we tend to be quite disembodied in the way that we do that. But what does it mean to actually recast what we encounter, not through interpreting what we meet in terms of the views and the opinions themselves, but to step behind that and just think, okay, uh, this person who says something that's triggered me, um, is a vulnerable person who's breathing and maybe turning or maybe reaching for something right now. And again, that's kind of silly. And you might say, well, what does that, what, what does that show you? Or, but it, you know, it's kind of before what you're being shown or what's revealed, it's kind of how can we access a more basic uh, common ground, uh, a more basic common human experience. And I think uh, in that respect, um, embodiment is extreme, is, is, is extremely uh, generative, but also I think very much typically in, in, in discourse around this uh, underappreciated in particular, you know, the attention economy, uh, where our minds go, how we engage is very much a, a focus of many uh, conversations around tech. And, and a quote from uh, Yuval Noah Harari, um, I think really captures this, that he says, um, you know, going forwards uh, for every minute and every dollar that we invest in artificial intelligence, we collectively, humanity, should spend a dollar and a minute investing in our human consciousness. And actually, that's, I think that's a very, uh, a very good, nice, simple point that I agree with. But most people's reaction to that, when you talk about human consciousness, is something immaterial of the mind. It's like, okay, so there's AI, there's what our minds can do. And that's fine. But actually, what if it's, you know, what our embodied presence, our embodiedness, actually has to offer and I think that's as yet I think quite an untapped um, area for exploration. Um, now I haven't asked, answered your question I think on opinion vis-a-vis -vis ego but I don't know if that's anything you wanted to come back on Jonathan or? Um, yeah for me Mina yeah so um, um, where to start so I, I feel as though the, the ego has its own dignity and, and I think we offer there's a lot of ego bashing so yeah certainly the banality of ego is the, is the thin end of the wedge. I mean, people critique the ego for all sorts of reasons and to be egoic or to have a big ego is considered a, usually a bad thing. But the ego as an organizing principle is also what keeps the psyche together. It gives us a sense of individuality of, if not individuation, it gives us some kind of co sort of coherence of the self. And we believe it's an evolving process that the ego somehow um, matures and uh, those with no ego at all may struggle to get through life. So there's a certain dignity in the ego. And I suppose my concern and my question is that 
in the analog world, your ego in, enters the, the arena, let's say, and that arena will be with other people, with bodies in three dimensions or four dimensions um, in which you share the same atmosphere and see the viscera and blinks of the eyes and you know you're there in the same same atmosphere the same space online of course not only do you not really see people's faces usually with all of that means in terms of levinas and kind of empathy and all that that means but also that as you say when you engage in twitter you don't have this image of these icons and avatars sort of representing real embodied beings somewhere out there in the globe with real uh, emotional and spiritual and physical needs, they become informational devices. And I think what Tom Chatwood writes about, and I think maybe you quoted as well in your essay, that there's a risk that we begin to process everything in informational terms and not in emotional terms and yeah. so forth. So I guess I'm, I'm interested to know if the ego, qua ego, is a useful device for making sense of what's different about the digital realm. Because when you enter the digital realm and sort of surrender your body and sort of surrender your physical context, What's left is this kind of unhinged, untethered ego. Um, and that's the thing that carries the opinion. And that's the thing that cares about the opinion and will live and die for it online um, in a way that might seem absurd in person. Uh, now, of course, that's yeah. magnified by algorithms and perpetuated by all sorts of um, technological devices. But I still think there's something about if what we're interested in is to ask the question, what is this? I think the form of the answer might be something about what this is, is a relationship between the ego and opinion formation, opinion formation and identity formation. And what is this that we need to let go of might be something about the relationship between opinion and, and identity. And, and, and behind yeah. that, maybe even survival or, you know, something deeper behind that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, that's um it's a really good reflection. And I guess it's probably just worth saying, um, of course, there's different different traditions uh, kind of understand the ego in different terms. So in, in the essay, uh, I, I define it quite generally, uh, not strictly in accordance to um, kind of uh, various kind of uh, Indian spiritual uh, traditions uh, and, and, and a lot of the kind of contemporary literature actually also runs with this kind of definition, but I, I, I define it broadly in those terms, which is, um, in, in so far as opinions are concerned, um, actually, in, rather than defining the ego or digital ego, I simply say, um, when it comes to opinions and views that we hold uh, about who we are, what we stand for, and what we believe about the world, um, we can differentiate a little bit between what we, what our opinion is, and how tightly we're holding uh, to that, and of course, then othering uh, those who don't conform uh, with that. So. Um, uh, you know, online, of course, we all we, we all know that a lot of people seem to hold very tightly to opinions. They get very charged. I call it egoically charged um, in, in in different ways, and, and of course, clash against each other. Um, and I'm careful there not to say ego equals bad or that um, objective equals elimination of ego, which is which is not you know my personal view. Um, but but that's so. Where I go with this essay and asking what is this is. Um, looking at where the more charged in a problematic sense um, uh, forms of egoic behavior um, can be questioned. Uh, and that question per se, as we've discussed, can kind of um, create a little bit of space uh, uh, for optionality, how to respond. But I think you're, you're obviously, you're absolutely right that a more psychoanalytic um, uh, perspective could well see the ego, qua ego, as all about integration of our experience internally, uh, integrating you know different facets, but also integration, self vis-a-vis -vis world, and what that looks like, and that project of dynamic um, kind of integration and growth, uh, where absolutely again there's no kind of um, quieting necessarily, certainly no elimination of ego, but what does it look like to integrate better? Um, and again, I guess uh, in so far as how platforms which seem to centralize, seem to have the energy around uh, a world of opinions are concerned. I guess the, the question remains then, um, you know, how, how can I integrate? How can I see myself in a wider context? I can't see a, I, I can't see a strong case for thinking about the ego's role as integrator as a purely inner 
um, function, but I think it's the inner outer as well as within the inner. Um, and so, you know, within the inner, the integrative uh, capacity of the ego is challenged if we become very quite quite strongly disembodied. Um, but of course, vis-a-vis -vis the world and vis-a-vis -vis each other, you know, something as simple as uh, the development where we have indiv individualized feeds, where we're all seeing, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a algorithmically honed, but all seeing a different reality uh, through our screens. Um, you know, services that fragmentation uh, across people. Um, so I think uh, I think it's the Theodore Zeldin talks about um, the more possibilities for framing, the more possibilities for seeing things in different contexts that we have to choose from. Uh, the, 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 you know, the more we can flourish, the more we can grow, uh, the better uh, you know our options will be. And I think you know at the heart of many of the issues uh, that are discussed around polarization and things. Um, with you know open-mindedness uh, online um, is precisely this issue of like actually how can there's no shortage of information but how can I recontextualize or how can I see things uh, in multiple contexts and choose between them and I think that's where uh, the integrative ego can flourish is where we're able to expand uh, the, the set of contexts because let's face it I think with with many of our uh, existing uh, platforms um, you know, this issue of, it's sometimes called context collapse, it's not used quite in the way I'm going to use it here, but, you know, context collapse that, you know, everything is taken out of context and amplified, of course, for particular, uh, according to a particular dynamic that, you know, around outrage that I think we're all familiar with. So, I guess, what is this? And also, what is this context or what could this context uh, more widely construed be for me? Um, maybe a question that's generative for that. Um, thank you. So um, to close, I guess, unless um, Jonathan and, and Anna still have questions after, after the one I just want to ask you. Um, we've spoken a lot about the kind of the value that asking open-ended questions can bring uh, psychoanalytically um, and in, a, in an embodied way. Um, but in these times where, you know, we're facing climate emergency, there's the pandemic, there's division and authoritarianism and all of these big problems that, that really seep into the opinions and the public conversation, um, I thought it could be interesting to, to kind of briefly at least touch upon what value open-ended questioning brings to the kind of the, the social, the sociopolitical um, rather than the psychoanalytical. Um, and I'm thinking about that because it, it feels to me like, I mean, a lot of the, both the, the, the interior individual dilemmas that online media proposes, as well as the socio-political ones, have to do with some kind of um, crisis in the way that we relate um, both to ourselves and, and to others, and then uh, reaching out even further to, to our environment. Um, and so is there a question here about how like what is our relationship to technology um, and how can that, um, how can open-ended questions uh, help us with the, the socio-political elements of this? Yeah, it's a great question. And I mean, there's so much to say, uh, to, to pretend to explore here, but I think there's, if there's one thing, that one word in my mind in, in response to that is intentionality, um, you know, with the practice, of actually getting into the habit of just asking what is this what's going on here what am I actually doing here or what, what is this before me and when you practice that the more you practice that um, you, you do get this ability uh, you know support your capacity to be intentional by that I mean obviously do I want to continue using this or having this exchange um, you know picking your battles do I really want to get into this does this really matter not does the issue matter often the issue matters but the point is does my engagement in this way through this platform at this time, is that how best I can serve, um, uh, serve, serve you know, the situation before me? And actually that point about service, you know, if I, if, if I said that flipping the question around from what do I want to do here to how can I be of service uh, is, is, is a helpful kind of switch to make. Um, you know, you might say, oh, that sounds like you're kind of pushing for being more altruistic and other regarding in, 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 in your behavior. But actually, 
I see from the inside, you know, um, switching from what can I get to what can I offer or how can I serve? This is not um, a kind of negating my own <laughs> kind of um, uh, wants in the service of someone else's, but actually service per se. Uh, how can I serve? What can I do here? Is actually um, uh, a very meaningful, very kind of life affirming um, uh, disposition to take when you practice it. I just encourage people to, to try that out. And um, uh, so I think just reframing uh, what matters, you know, intentionality, why am I doing, what actually matters here? And again, easy to get caught up in, um, in the debates themselves. But again, if you, in the essay, hopefully, we'll try and explore where are my energies best used for the limited time I've got, you know, this day and this, this lifetime. Uh, and what is this as a way of just continually reminding ourselves, what do I want to do here? What can I do? I mean, you think of um, the philosopher John Searle's theory of um, collective intentionality. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe if intentionality is something that we bring as individuals when we go onto these platforms, um, in terms of like the, the wider political questions, uh, exploring collective intentionality, what, what, what kinds of shared goals and aims do we have that transcend the, the endless um, debates and opinion making? So, yeah, just thought I'd share that. But um, does anybody else? Or, Anna, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Mina, that just um, connects to the point you just made as well. Um, I just, you know, because Dan, you started with this Benjaminian idea that our technologies can help us see the world differently, you know, that the camera can teach us, that the cinema can teach us to, to see, to, you know, that they basically change the structure of our perception. And you also mentioned that you hoping that the digital technologies will do that in a positive way. And I just um, wondered what way that could be and whether there's anything positive you can see about um, digital technologies and how they may impact in a beneficial way on our perception and also on our social interactions. And, and I was just thinking that, you know, this, I mean, one thing surely that they bring home is our interconnectedness. That's a very banal point, but in, in a way there is this, you know, sense of connection, interrelatedness, um, and, you know, the, the idea of the network and that we're all yeah. part of this sort of big network. Yeah. And I just wanted to hear whether you had any, any other thoughts on how, how digital technologies can actually um, shape our perception in, in a positive or a negative way. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a nice uh, question to end on. Um, I mean, I'm going to dodge it a tiny bit only because uh, there's, uh, there's so many ways already and we're doing it now. And if you're the viewer watching, you know, uh, there's just no hint in, in, in what I'm doing in, in, in this piece of suggesting anything other than the potential uh, you know, the affordances of these technologies, you know, to open up what we can see and how we can see together in all kinds of positive ways. And uh, I don't have a, a kind of witty or, or, or pithy example, but there's so many uh, examples that I think we're all familiar with. Um, but so the reason I'm going to kind of turn it around just in the spirit of uh, talking about questioning per se, I guess I feel that whatever whatever the ways that we're developing ourselves and, and, and designing our technologies to you know to work better for us to serve to serve us in a deep sense um i think coming back to this uh questioning again and again um feels like more than anything just a very uh timeless uh uh thing of value uh to bring and again i, I said at the beginning you know more than questioning per se my as you alluded to it it's this it's this idea of how, what are we seeing and how do we see, how do we see each other and how do we see the world? Um, and, and Maurice Merleau-Ponty, phenomenologist that I um, say a few times in the piece, um, he says something, it might sound very obvious, but I think it's actually quite deep that um, it's at the same time true that the world is what we see, but at the same time that we need to learn to see it. Uh, and, and many artists recently, I think I read something from David Hockney, but many, many artists, um, uh, and poets as well will kind of um, really push us to consider this basic act of looking, uh, this basic act of seeing in a participatory way. Don't take that for granted. And actually that's something which itself is the basis of 
at the most, you know, kind of deep basis for kind of um, ongoing uh, 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 cultivation, you know, something we learn over and over again and never uh, stop learning. So I guess, you know, there's so much on the tech side and I'm really positive about so much of it. And I hope that does come through even though I focus on some of these more um, problematic aspects, but um, through questioning, can we help ourselves to really learn how to see throughout our whole lifetime? And I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. I think that that's, uh, okay, sorry, Jonathan, go ahead. Well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not so much a question then, it's more a, um, just to reaffirm the value of what you're doing in, in that, you know, when The Social Dilemma was a very popular Netflix documentary that came out quite recently that we actually reviewed here on Perspectiva, but um, the premise of that was, was kind of that the individual was in some sense helpless against the enormous forces of technology. And the main reason for that is not technology as such, but often when we say technology, we really mean capitalism, right? We often really mean the profit motive underlying the technological infrastructure. Um, and that matters in this context because Mina's question is pertinent. How do you mobilize a socio-political response? And in what way does a personal response help to develop that? I think that's really the key question. But what I like about what you've done is where Tristan Harris might say, look, stop thinking about individualized solutions. And Jaron Lanier might say, look, you've got no chance. Um, there is a sense in which you're saying, well, look, yes and no. Like there, there are still things we can do. Now in your case, you're, you know, trained mindfulness teacher. And so your, your capacity to, you've got a cultivated capacity over your own reactions and your own reactivity. But what's interesting about the essay is you're sort of saying, look, there's a difference between a train, I think, there's a difference between training um, and then seeing what you can do in response to this massive infrastructure and just assuming that everyone is equally unable to do it. Um, so it's a, I saw it as quite a hopeful note that just to have the time to ask what is this and give yourself a chance to react differently could be politically generative. Um, it's not a small thing. It seems a small thing, but the reason the essay is of value, I think, is that it, it forces us to consider the possibility that we do, after all, have some agency in that space. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Yeah, and I'd like to echo that as well and just add that it seems as a, I mean, that it isn't a small thing, but it is a, a relatively simple thing. And that's of great value that we can just approach something with simplicity. Um, and I really appreciate the words of just needing to learn something as simple as to see. Um, you know, we all think that we know how to do that. And I guess anything really that's related to the senses, um, we think we know how to to see, to smell, to touch, to just have human interaction and dialogue. Um, but really your essay uh, leaves us feeling that we still need to learn these things. These are lifelong journeys of learning for, for all of us. Um, and so it's a really beautiful as well as an insightful and informative read. Um, it's been an honor working on it with you. Um, and I hope that everybody checks it out. So um, yeah, thank you for joining us. Cool. Thanks. See you then. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.